The Huskers held the lead into the fourth quarter, but couldn't close it out against Wisconsin as the Badgers win 15 to 14 and take their ninth straight against Nebraska. Big Red will have one more chance in 2022 before major changes take place within the program with the hiring of a new coach. We'll look back at the Wisconsin game and preview the Black Friday game against Iowa. The voice of the Huskers, Greg Sharp. Brian Christopherson from 24-7 Sports also joins us. Sean Callahan will have the latest in Nebraska recruiting. All coming up next on Big Red Wrap. Hi, everyone. I'm Michael Severe. Welcome to Big Red Wrap-Up on Nebraska Public Media. It was kind of deja vu all over again against Minnesota and then against Wisconsin. Joining us to talk more about that, it is former Husker Jay Moore and Sean Callahan. It does feel like we're seeing the same story. It goes back almost to what Scott Frost said last year against Illinois. It's the same book, yep. same movie over yep. and over again. Yep, same stuff, different day. Yep. You know, and uh, we've always, we've, I've always joked with people, you know, doing the show, it's like you could just... Somehow, if you could just dub over our voices and say <laughs> the name of the team, Minnes yeah, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Illinois, uh, we probably don't have to do the show very much because it's, it's literally the same results week in and week out. Uh, it was it's the for once watching that game on Saturday and they're up 14 to three. My mind did go. Wow, I think they might be able to pull this thing out. And I went there and I go. Shame on me. Positive, Jay. Yeah, Good job. Shame on, shame <laughs> on me. And uh, and then, you know, when they get the 14-9, you're like, uh-oh. Yeah. You know, or they're going into the win there, and you're not able to run the football what's, uh, at all. And obviously, you struggle to throw the ball. Anyone's going to struggle throwing the football into that wind and that, and, uh, and that coldness. So just uh, you saw it coming. It was uh, it was a slow bleed, man. You saw, you saw it coming, and uh, unfortunately, they're just not able to pull it out, you know, and another one score loss for, for the Huskers. Again, the defense fought. Another great first half by them. Yeah, they continued to be lined up right. Um, you look at the, even the grades on Pro Football Focus, that was the highest graded game as a unit Nebraska has had. What, what, what it tells you is guys are in position to make plays. They've given up some yards, uh, but they've limited the big runs. Under Bill Bush, Nebraska's only allowed three 20 plus yard runs. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, heck, against North Dakota, they allowed more than that in one game right. um, when you go back to kind of where this defense was at the start of the season. And I think they've made teams earn it. Uh, the problem is they're just not getting the support on the other end. And you start to see that offense get those quick three and outs. The defense, those one, two-yard runs become three, four, five-yard runs. Wisconsin averaged five and a half yards per run on 25 first-down runs alone in that game on, on Saturday. Yeah, it was a lot of times where he was getting through the line, Allen, or the backup. And he wouldn't get touched until the second level. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he, I mean, they, they schemed it nicely. You know, I will say even this is not Wisconsin's best offensive line, probably one of the worst that we've seen since uh, we've been in the Big Ten going against Wisconsin. Uh, they, they're coming off the ball. They still, they still work very well as a unit. Mm -hmm. um, guys were, you know, they just weren't able to get off the blocks initially. And they, they, um, but I tell you what, uh, you had some guys show up and play, though. Ernest Hausman yeah. has, uh, has gotten remarkably better uh, th during the season. I mean, Saw him struggle earlier in the year, and all of a sudden, boom, you know, you think about him potentially redshirting at one point, and then with Hendricks getting hurt, he steps up, and, man, he's played his tail off, and that is a bright future for uh, a true freshman. I mean, the kid was walking in the halls of Columbus High School <laughs> this time last year, so uh, very impressed with that. But yeah, it was a little discouraging to see the D-line not get off blocks and make some plays, but I tell you what, it's, it's, you're going to have some of that, but it was nice to see those guys step up. Farmer came up and filled nicely in those holes, and, um, which, you know, hate to see Buford get uh, injured as well early in the game, but but it's going to happen, and it's, Wisconsin knows, you know, they know who they are. So I'm, I want to put too much weight into that. Uh, but I tell you what, they got a big challenge again in going against Iowa this week. Casey Thompson certainly makes a difference. You can just feel it in the stadium when he's out there. Didn't have a huge day, but made some big throws. Yeah, he, his, just his ability to find Trey Palmer on those two key touchdown throws that he made. I mean, those were really the only two passes of significance mm -hmm. Nebraska had down the field the entire game. There was only one. That win was so strong that only one pass was completed by either team that traveled 20 or more yards. It happened to be the wheel route right. that helped Wisconsin win the game, a key throw that Graham Mertz made. Um, so throws were at a premium, but Casey did what he needed to do on a couple of these throws to find Trey Palmer. Also does a good job, as you can see, just taking what's there. If no one's open, finds that run, gets those type of yards. And you don't want this guy running if you don't have to, but uh, <laughs> they had to use Casey's legs uh, to get things freed up in this offense. Um, he does a great job as well of avoiding the sacks. For as much pressure as he takes, yeah. you know, he doesn't take near as many sacks as he could um, just getting rid of the football. A third of every drop back he has, he had pressure this year, according right. to Pro Football Focus. We have taped the show, so our phone lines are not open. Don't call right now. Um, but it doesn't mean you still can't reach out to us. 
as the season's winding down. You can always send comments or questions anytime through email or text. Big Red at NebraskaPublicMedia.org. You can reach out to us on our social media channels as well. Here's this week's all-new sideline survey. What's more likely to happen on Friday? Nebraska wins, Iowa wins, or Nebraska announces a new football coach. It looks like 44% right now Iowa wins, 27% Nebraska wins, and 29% of people hopeful that we get a coach announcement pretty quickly. Let's jump straight into the highlights now, looking back at Saturday's game. Despite the cold and the wind, it actually wasn't that bad of a day. It could have been worse for this time of year. But we fast forward past the first quarter when not a lot happened. Second quarter, Nebraska's defense stepping up again. Malcolm Herzog as a freshman. Wow, what a season he's had. You know, just talking about you know him, Houseman, that's, that's, a, that's some uh, bright future for two young kids on the – kind of the back end of the defense. And as Sean said earlier with with Casey Thompson avoiding the pressure and getting some runs, 53 net yards or gross yards, excuse me, rushing on the day. Just a real good accomplishment getting and avoiding those guys. Yeah, it's you got to feel it. You got to step up and you know, 1, 1,000, 2, 1,000, 3, 1,000. That's what's going to the head of the QBs. And if you can't find anyone there, you better get out of Dodge. One of the biggest plays of the game right there, the third down completion, which ends up setting up the touchdown pass to Trey Palmer. But Vokalek, if he was healthy all season, I think he could have had a pretty huge. Yeah, that ankle injury early on in the, the season uh, against Northwestern, you know, but he's still, I mean, it's just a big target. Nice, big uh, body, long arms, but that was a good good throw there by uh, Casey to Trey. 7 nothing, Nebraska. One of the longer runs for Braylon Allen right there. Nine yards as they're trying to score before the end of the half, and then a two-yard loss. Good job here by Nebraska's front again. Yeah, just, again, I was thinking I was Nash. Just did a good job with point of attack, and that's all you're trying to do, slow them up and let your, let your buds come here and rally around you and make a play. Our next guest got a big laugh off of this field goal uh, that felt, it ended up short with the wind knocking it down. It was amazing. It just stops. Yeah. It Brutal. just literally stops. He didn't knock that. He needed a, a five iron instead of a six iron. There. It goes back to what, uh, <laughs> what Tom Osborne said about yeah. playing in November. <laughs> yeah, no doubt about that. Uh, end around here, one carry uh, for a first do- uh, first down there. It was Keon Lewis, uh, his only carry there of the game. Oh, that was Bell, excuse me, his only carry of the game. He also had a catch in the game. Uh, and then you have the pass there for Mertz uh, to Keon Lewis, and then a field goal attempt to get him on the board. Seven to three. Nebraska defense again, stepping up big. They've been good all year. I tell you what, when they kind of get – down there getting the red zone. Nebraska's held up tight uh, numerous times this year. I'm reminded of the R- Rutgers game after the block punt. Nebraska's able to hold the uh, Rutgers to a field goal there. So they've been, they've been good when all they the get close guys, to the red zone. All the guys I'm going to miss, Chancellor Brewington's right at the top. He's just so fun to watch. Could have got some better blocking there uh, on the play and probably would have went a little bit farther there. But, you know, that happens sometimes on those screens. Um, and then Thompson down the middle, wide open. How does Trey Palmer get so wide open? I'll tell you, it was a switch route, mm-hmm. and they went with Omar Manning. Yep, yeah, they did. Yeah, he, and mistake. He, yeah, yeah mistake. They gave him yeah. a nice little fake, a little uh, act like he's running a corner out there, and boom, just kind of sat down the middle and wide open. Nebraska gets the two score lead up 14 to 3. Herzog kind of lost contain there. Yeah, it happens. You get guys, you kind of jump up in there, and and uh, I think it might have been Newsom too, or yeah. But, uh, you know, it's just that, that's going to happen. you got to kind of just be patient and, you know, so, sometimes you uh, lose contain. That was the longest run of the day, 22 yards. And then that seemed like that was kind of a win thing. Almost the ball went back behind the defender for the touchdown. That was yeah, it was a good throw, though. You know, it's just it was a good, good scramble. Throw. Yeah, probably should have been intercepted when he, when he threw it. I thought it was going to be intercepted. That was the only catch of the day for Bell there. Uh, now it's 14-9 after the missed two-point conversion. And there's the play of the day. Choose on my Sean. Longest pass of the day? Yeah, longest throw. Only throw of 20-plus yards for either team in terms of traveling in the air. Look at the clock tick off on this. Six seconds. They should put back on the clock here to give Nebraska more time after that because the score happens, so the play's got to stop there, but it doesn't. Nebraska one last shot trying to come back and get a field goal. Uh, Trey Palmer with the drop there. Wouldn't really matter. Time had run out. Nebraska falls 15 to 14. Let's look, let's look at final stats. Look at this. These are second half stats primarily for Wisconsin. They had zero big plays in the first half, but bounced back to have 318 total. Um, you can see that overall, more first downs, of course, time of possession, all the things you've expected from the brass games over the last couple of months. Here's the players of the game showing you how valuable he is to the offense. Casey Thompson sparked the team with two touchdowns and even showed some of his toughness with his feet. On the defensive side, Ernest Hausman was great, as Jay said. Second week in a row wins defensive player of the game. 12 total tackles, 10 solo tackles. We're pleased to be joined by the voice of the Huskers, Greg Sharp. How are you doing, sir? Gentlemen, good to be invited. Good to be on the show. It's good to see you. What's this feel? It's 15 years, I believe, right? Isn't your yeah, 15th season? 15. Your 15th wow. season. Um, <laughs> right? It flew by, really, it did. Um, but what's the feel like been for you up there in the booth? It's been hard. This last two years particularly have been really hard. I went through the numbers the other day. We've played 23 football games the last two years. 14 have been decided by one score. Mm. 
and we're one in 13 in those 14 games. Mathematically, it's almost impossible. Yep. It's been really difficult and heartbreaking, you know, for the players and the coaches who put so much effort and work in to come so close week after week. It's been hard. You're around Mickey Joseph, obviously, a lot behind the scenes. What have you seen just with him managing this program and just how big of a challenge do you think this was to step in and do what he's done the last 11 weeks? been very impressed. I didn't know Mickey very well at all before he got here last December, but I've been really impressed with the way he's managed things, the way he has kind of endeared himself to the players and the other coaches on the staff. Remember, this isn't a staff he put together. Mm -hmm. He didn't know most of these guys at all until 11 months ago. But just really impressed with his maturity and his ability to kind of wrap his arms around things and the way he just interacts even with the equipment guys and the managers and the, the assistants, student assistants and all that. It's impressive to watch Mickey work a room. The one guy he did know was Bill Bush. When they he made did. that switch, I know a lot of people said, what's it going to matter? It's the same talent. Defense has played so much better. Bill's done a really good job as well and has a lot of the same qualities that Mickey does. Mm -hmm. He's a good people person, and he identifies with the players. I love the uh, – I can't remember who made the quote. Sean will remember it, but one of the players said, oh, he's hard on us, and he used the, the butt term. <laughs> but he goes, then he wraps his arms around us. So Bill is tough, but then he goes up and tells him how much he loves him mm -hmm. and cares about him. And I think that's a, that's a nice play. That's a nice thing that an assistant coach can have. Greg, we saw the you – know, Talking about Bill, he makes a change, gets rid of Chenander, Bill Bush becomes a defensive corner. And you've seen the defense kind of get better throughout the season. Are you surprised you haven't seen that uh, on the offensive side of the ball so far this year? That they seem like seemingly they've gotten a little yeah. kind of worse as, no. as years going on. It's rather surprising. That's exactly right. The defense has trended up, the offense has trended down. Now, how much of that was the injury to Casey after the, in the Illinois game? Yeah, that definitely did bothered and I think we're playing better defenses later in the season yeah but I you know I, I'm not sure that what Mark Whipple's doing week in and week out is really in, is fits what the talents of this team are so it's certainly been a, a different trajectory for both the offense and defense and since the really since the dismissal of Scott Frost mm -hmm. what's your feel just on on what's next for Nebraska because obviously you got to call this game Friday but you're going to walk on that plane from Iowa City Probably saying, what is my Saturday going to look like? What is my Sunday yeah. going to look like? What is my Monday going to look like? Aren't we all? I mean, yeah. we all are, yeah. yeah. And, and But you're, you're going to have the backstage pass to kind of that plane going home. What, what are you expecting? Well, I, I think Mickey feels like it's not going to be him. I think he's kind of resigned himself to that. And so where it goes from here, that's up to Trev. And maybe only Trev knows at this point in time what that's going to be. But it's certainly going to be unsettling, uncertain. As Put yourself, in, and, and Jay can relate to this, put yourself as an 18, 19, 20-year-old kid. You don't like uncertainty like this. These guys' heads are all spinning right now. They're hearing from their high school coaches because those high school coaches are hearing from other coaching staffs around the country. So I think the quicker Nebraska can get this buttoned up, the better for the future of the program because the longer you wait and let those kids stay in limbo for the next week, 10 days, could be damaging to the program. Greg, there's no proven way, right, how to hire a head coach. There's a bunch of assistants that are in the top 25, guys who were proven coaches before. Some were elevated in the program. What does it take, in your opinion, for a head coach in the Big Ten, one more year with the West, to win here? What, is, what should Trev be looking for? Well, I, I think you've got to have somebody who – their life is football, mm -hmm. and you're constantly working at it. The grind, you're constantly guy. grinding at it. Uh, and, and I'm not trying to say somebody hasn't done that. Don't, I'm not implying that, but you do have to put your heart and soul at it. And you've got to figure out what you want to be. And you look at the programs that we've been playing the last couple weeks, they know what they want to oh, be, yeah. whether it's Harbaugh at Michigan or what we're going to see from Ferentz on Friday, what we've seen from the Wisconsin program for the last 10 years. Those programs know what they are. They're built to win in November. You made the comment yeah. about Tom Osborne in November. That if you play in this division in this weather, you better be built to win games late in the season. I think that'll be important too. Greg, what, what would you want in a coach? It's, it's kind of the chicken or the egg. Is it a, you want a developer or a recruiter? You know, because you can you yeah. get lesser talent, develop them, or do you get better talent and let them go? Which which one would you like to favor? Both. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and that's the easy way. But yeah. that's the problem. And, yeah. and I, Jay, and I, and maybe you guys disagree, but I really feel like, really, for the last ten years, we've not developed kids well enough here. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. And you're not going to win a ton of recruiting battles against the upper echelon teams in the country. So you better develop the heck out of them when they get them here. And I'm not sure we've done a good enough job on that, particularly along both lines of scrimmage. Michonne, they brought guys in. Like, I looked the other day. Turner Corcoran, I believe, was the sixth or seventh highest rated guy ever recruited by Nebraska. I think, Obviously hasn't developed into that. I think the biggest thing is Nebraska's had to push these guys in earlier mm. 
than a Wisconsin or Iowa or some of these programs have. You know, you put a Teddy uh, Prohaska as a true freshman. Yeah. Turner Corcoran started in December as a true freshman in 2020. Um, you know, they don't have much time to develop. And then you kind of mess with these guys mentally when they struggle right out of the gates. Um, and the fan criticism, it's, it's yeah. tough. Or in the pro football focus scores that we all publish on Sundays and they're not pretty. I mean, that gets the guys' heads mentally. And I, I think when you put young players out, I mean, look at Ethan Piper. He actually almost benefited by being benched yeah. to have a couple years to catch his breath. And now he looks a lot better. Um, so it, it, it's tough with these younger guys. I think they've played a lot of them earlier maybe than other programs have had to. That'd be number one priority, getting that offensive line fixed. Get old, stay old. Yeah, you hear that term Ross a lot. And, that's, and Mickey has learned that going through this Big Ten. He's like, my gosh, they've got 20 <laughs> 50-year seniors yeah. and 60-year seniors that are playing out there. These are 24-year-old men against sometimes 19 and 20 for us. It makes a difference on the field. You know, we joke a lot about the Big Ten and the way they play, style of play. But you heard it from Scott Frost after a year. You've heard it from other assistants. And now Mickey, who played in what's supposed to be the best conference or coach in the best conference, you hear it constantly. Man, the Big Ten is tough. This is tough to win here. It's a grown man's league. Yeah. And the line of scrimmage is really solid in this conference. And so you better start there. Yeah. So going back to Jay's point, I think it better start with line play. You better be good along the lines or we're going to have the same cycle going. Yeah, I think you have to create a style that fits this weather, like you said. Yeah. And, I mean, the way that game was Saturday, it wasn't about being pretty out there. No. I mean, it was how do you get five yards? And, and Wisconsin, Iowa, Minnesota, at least in the, in the West right now, have mastered that. That's right. You think about USC and UCLA coming here and all these conversations we're having. They, they don't know what they're in for, do they? They do not know what they're in for. And just look at all the teams that have made conference jumps. A lot of people have had a hard time. True. And look out, Texas and Oklahoma, it's coming to you guys next. That change for you guys to the SEC is going to be a big leap for both programs. Speaking of change, you got a new color guy in the yeah. booth with you and Damon Benning, who usually sits right there every other week. How's that been, kind of the transition? Oh, you got a team in the booth, really, and you, you established are. a long relationship with Matt Davis. It's, it, it, because I've known Damon for so long, mm. it's not like I'm walking into a thing that I didn't know him at all. Right. So I think it's been pretty smooth. I mean, mm -hmm. I'll let the listeners d d <laughs> give us a feedback on that. But Damon is always so well prepared, knows football inside and out. So it's been a, it's been a lot of fun. It's hard, too. Uh, I was talking to someone the other day, and I, and I listen to every game. Um, I have it up in my ear. And... You get all excited because you get a score. Yep, yep. All of a sudden, 14 to 3. And I could hear in you guys' voice. You're like, oh, my God, we're going to get a win. And then at the end, you're like, here we go. Here we go again. It's really hard. <laughs> Jay said the same thing earlier. You kind of got that excitement going to that fourth quarter going, I think it may happen. I really think today might be the day. And then, man, the deflation happened in that last seven, eight minutes. What are you thinking for Iowa when you look at this yeah. matchup? I mean, it seems like kind of the same type of opponent Nebraska's played for the last month. If you can not give up a non-offensive touchdown, you probably beat them. But it's hard to do because they find a way to yep. score, whether it's a scoop and score, a pick six, a block punt, a kick return. That's how they beat you. And it, you can sit there and go, well, that should be easy to do. Mm -hmm. It's not. They force you to do those type of things. And here they, here they are again. They're a win away from winning this division. And that would, would have been a laughable comment a month ago with where they were offensively. But there they are. They know what they're doing. They're built for November. But this is still a winnable game for oh, Nebraska. Yeah. Yeah. I was telling the guys before, the last two games, I was giving up 200 more yards than they've had, right? They've given up almost 10 sacks over the last three games, but yet they find a way. And it's usually defense, right, or special teams is how they get it done. Last year, block punt late yeah. in the game. Cost the Huskers that game against Iowa in that one. So that's what they live on. And it would be frustrating to be a fan of the Hawkeyes, wouldn't it? I mean, you go to, the, go to <laughs> Kinnick and go, well, can we even move? Can we get three first downs today? That'd be great. But then they walk out of there as a winner. We all walk out with the punter T-shirts on. That's the guy. That's the star <laughs> yeah. of the team. It'll be, if they lost, again, Nebraska would be eight straight losses to Iowa. It's nine to Wisconsin. There's no way we thought you, you came in partway through 2007 and then 2008. When we came into the Big Ten, I don't think anybody could have predicted this. No way. The last time we beat Iowa, it's both Bo last, last game, game mm -hmm. and the overtime win and Kenny Bell making the catch at the yeah. goal line. So since 2014, it has uh, flipped uh, for the Huskers against Iowa and, the, and Wisconsin. And, you know, I, I don't know. We've heard people say, well, we got to shoot for Ohio State. I think we need to shoot to be the best team on our side of the conference. And I know the divisions are going away. Yeah. But you better start first beating the Iowas and the Wisconsins before you set your sights on the Buckeyes. Yeah, we can see the longest conference losing streaks going back to the Oklahoma one when Oklahoma won all those games in a row. But Wilkinson back in the day. But those Wisconsin and Iowa ones really jump. It's one thing to lose seven in a row to Ohio State. They're one of the top three teams in the country. But to Wisconsin and Iowa, that's tough. And that wasn't a great Wisconsin team last no, week. I mean, no. I think everybody walked away going, man, that's, that, they've fallen off. And you can see probably why they made that change a month or so ago when we were all going, wow, they fired Paul Christ. Yeah. But I think they saw what was happening with the program.
Well, in the West Division has never been more attainable. But, I mean, this is the first time the division will have a six-win winner. Right. Yep. Uh, it's always been seven and two, eight and one, nine and zero. Oh, mm -hmm. uh, to have a six and three division winner when your crossover games for Nebraska were Indiana yeah. and Rutgers. Yeah. I mean, it was gift wrapped it for was. Nebraska if they had it figured out this year to make a run at this division. Sure was. Do you have a feel when we're going to get the announcement at all? Well, I saw a moving truck in my neighborhood today. I, I didn't, couldn't stick around, so I had to get here. So I, didn't, I don't know who it was that got out of the truck, but I don't. I really don't. And right. I don't know that anybody does. And right. it's amazing how quiet this whole thing has been. And not just here around. Usually the word leaks from different parts yes. of the country. Agents, yeah. Agents get it out there. Right. But it's been really quiet. Yeah, it, it's strange that it would go this long and we not hear anything for real. But maybe that's a good thing. Maybe Trev does have his guy, and he's just, it's one person he's talking to, and that's it. Yeah. That, that's one way to keep a secret. Yeah. <laughs> Give us a prediction on the, uh, the Iowa game. Oh, I mean, what is it, 10-point spread, I think? Yeah, nine and a half, yeah. I, I think this is a game probably 20 to 13, 20 to 14, something in that range. Uh, I'd like to think that the ball could bounce the Huskers' way, but as I go back to that 14 games decided by one score, we're 1-13, yeah. it's hard to b yeah. push against that trend. Well, they're due. That's what it is. They're doing. There's no doubt. <laughs> Greg, it was good seeing you, man. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Greg Sharp, joining us. Welcome. Next up on the show, we break down a few plays and chat with Brian Christofferson from 24-7 Sports as we go to break images from Saturday's game, courtesy of Hill Varsity. Stay with us. We're back soon. All right, welcome back into the huddle. We're going to look at a couple offensive plays. We know offensive line struggled heavily in this game. We're going to break down a couple things and what I saw. So here, Nebraska has struggled picking up stunts. And we, we, I've broken down numerous uh, earlier already this year. So we're going to look at the top here. Ben Hart, I think this might be Latoski. I can't remember. I, I can't see his number right now. But as we look, they're going to bring kind of a delayed TE game here. And you're going to, as I play, watch this. This guy's kind of hanging. It's kind of, it's not a good game in my opinion. But he gets so heavy. And you got to be able to communicate. Right now, Ben Hart should be yelling, switch, pass it off, something. To him to be able to come up, he gets so heavy on, on this, the tackle that he's able to come out, boom, Casey has nowhere to step up. It's just you got to be able to communicate between the right tackle and right guard. There, obviously, there was none. Now, let's look at this. This is what we call the four-minute drill. Nebraska is able to get probably a first down, more than likely win the football game. This is the first play of this, of this drive. We're going to highlight this guard, uh, the defensive guard right here. Our offensive guard is going to, for some reason, I'm not understanding the schematics of this at all. Now I'm a defensive lineman. So uh, he's going to go, he's going to leave him. The center is going to try to cut him off. 
and it just is just not a good a good scheme here in my opinion. I just don't know what you, he leaves them, and he's trying to you're allowed the center's got to snap it, and then all of a sudden try to cut him off or get him. I just don't. It's it's just a weird scheme. I don't I'm not obviously there's some miscommunication here. Boom, he's right there. I mean, he's right in the face of Anthony Grant. There's nothing you want him to do. Actually, Anthony does a pretty good job of just getting darn near back to line of scrimmage. And again, struggles offensive line has cost this, uh, cost this offensive uh, offense heavily so far this year. Do you think it's more scheme or is it development or it's everything? What is it? It's I think it's that seemed like that was more scheme. That's scheme. I just don't understand. I mean, from, I just don't understand what you're trying to accomplish there. Uh, you're it, you're just giving it, it's maybe that's a backside, but that was kind of front side blocking yeah. there. So um, no, I think it's it's scheme. Um, I think to me the offensive line, the scheme, it looks almost too. They're trying to make be too complicated. I would like to see them. It's like you know what hat on hat, hat on hat, block the guy in front of you, or be physical, do something. You know you get a hat on hat. I mean you're, you should be able to get three yards every time. Yeah, it's crazy. But it's just about. it's it's <laughs> might be one of the most frustrating. <laughs> Offensive lines I've ever, I've ever watched at Nebraska. Yeah, you start looking at the tape, it will get you frustrated. <laughs> Time to check in with the team as they prepare for Friday's matchup with Iowa. You know, at the end, at the end of the day, um, we, we didn't get the job done enough to win the game. So, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a tough loss for sure. We got one mission left, one game. And I, I expect and I know our boys to come out and give full effort. This last game, a lot of pride. Last last game playing with some of their brothers. So I expect them to come out and play tough and be resilient through the whole game. I think they're better now than when I found them. I think they're, you know, they're a better team. They're a more confident team. They know they hadn't gotten the wins. But I think they're better people right now. I think they, they, can, see, they can see the growth in themselves. And I can see the growth in them. And I think that... They know that something's, you can build something here. They know we're a couple of pieces away because we don't play some close games. And we, when we come back on Sunday, we identify what happened. So we know we're a couple of pieces away that we need to get up in here to help us get over that hump. There's a lot of things that go into play and a lot of factors that go into it. But obviously, um, from the grand scheme of things, we've been a little bit off uh, this year. And uh, I know in the past, the last few years, so. Uh, whatever the reason may be, I'm excited to uh, see who's going to take over as the head coach. But obviously, that's um, they get paid a lot of the money to figure those 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 things out. Yeah, we just know what type of game it's going to be—a really physical fought game. Um, we know it's gonna be, that game is going to be one on the line of scrimmage. So uh, we've been really emphasizing just making sure um, our fits are really precise, um, and we know what, uh, what we got to do for each play. We're doing a good job of that. Um, you know, last game of the season, week 12, uh, we're still having great attitude, great effort. Still having good practices and a lot of buy-in in the locker room, so I'm really excited about this program and our future. Yeah, they can be the spoiler. Yeah, we talked about that, and I think it's the next game, and I know it's a rival game, so I, I know they're going to be up for it. They're going to be up for it. They're going to come out and, and, and play in full force this game. You're like Cam Meredith. Joined now by Brian Christopherson for 24/7 Sports. Brian, BC, how you doing? I'm doing well. Uh, it's good to be here. I, I was thinking about this. The last time I, I was here after a win mm -hmm. was the strange Penn State game in the Bo Pelina era. I'm pretty sure. Oh, of that. no. 2013? Like, yeah, I think that's how long it's been since I've been on this show Ten after years. a Husker win. I don't come on all the time, but yeah. I mean, that's kind of ridiculous. <laughs> well, we do the show every week. <laughs> really, do we do the show after a Husker win? <laughs> At least it's not that long. <laughs> yeah, it's been a long time. <laughs> what, what Sean mentioned, I think Jay did too, that you had a feel heading in the fourth quarter that maybe this was the week. Did you feel that way? The, Be honest. The, I thought it was 50-50. Okay. And I guess that's uh, just having seen what we've seen the last couple of years. It's a situation where we, when you're up 14 to three, you should be thinking, well, there's an 80 percent chance Nebraska is right. going to win this game. But Wisconsin had the wind. It felt like that seven and a half minute drive in the third quarter, even though it only ended up in a field goal, mm -hmm. was big because it took some of Nebraska's wind time away from them, their right. wind advantage away. And I also thought you could tell Wisconsin was kind of establishing itself up front and it was just going to be tough for Nebraska to hang on. You needed Graham Mertz to make that one 
mistake, more mistake, yeah. and instead he hits the throw on the wheel route, and there you go, kind of. Almost overthrew that, by the way, with the win. Yeah. The win almost took he did. It. Yeah. What did you think of that decision for Nebraska not to have the win for the fourth quarter? I mean, now we have the benefit of hindsight, but yeah. how, how big would that have been to have the win for the fourth quarter? That's a tricky call because I do know football coaches sometimes don't like to give you both. Like, right. they don't like to give you the ball and the win to start a quarter or a half. And so I, I understand the philosophy Nebraska had. So that's one of those where um, – I am I'm kind of with you where you, you always love having that at your back in the fourth quarter when, it, when it's crunch time. But I, I get why they, they did what they did. And honestly, when you're sitting there up 14 to 3, going in the fourth quarter, even though you're against the wind, I think you're feeling like we put ourselves in position. We just got to make a couple more plays one way or another. Mm -hmm. Going to this Iowa game now, is Iowa's defense the best or the second best behind Michigan that Nebraska will face this year? Oh, man. Um, mm. I think... I would put them up there right with Michigan um, because I remember watching Iowa play Ohio State this year, and I think that game ended up like 54 to 10 or something ridiculous. But Ohio State was frustrated as heck yeah. in the first half by Iowa, and I was thinking to myself, if the Buckeyes are scuffling around with these guys, that's a put-together unit. I mean, the fact that they have seven wins and can win the West Division is – it's uh, – I'm not going to say they're like Nebraska's what 09 defense or whatever, but it reminds me of that where one side of the ball is just doing all the heavy lifting, the other side stinks, and uh, and here they are still with a chance to win the division. What's remarkable is if you look at Wisconsin, Minnesota, and Iowa, I think they all were giving up 13 points a game. So it's very consistent. Everybody's giving up around 13 points a game. If you can get the two touchdowns, you can beat this team. You That's can. how I feel. You can. Uh, <laughs> But I thought Greg made the, made the right point. It comes down to Iowa just specializes in getting that defensive touchdown or they setting their offense up at the 10-yard line or whatever that yeah. is. Somehow, some way, Nebraska has to avoid that. It's, you used to think that was a little bit of, man, I was lucky and stuff like that. But it happens every week. At some point, you just got to tip your cap and say, wow, they're, they're built to take the ball away. Yep. You talk about the coaching uh, of Iowa. You know, the, the discussion for Big Ten Coach of the Year right now is really up in the air. I feel like about two weeks ago, it felt like Brett Bielema, Bielema was going to coast yeah. into it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, probably not going to win, not going to get it now. And then, I mean, do you think the coach of the year is probably down to the winner of Ohio State, Michigan, kind of whoever comes out of that game? Or could somebody else uh, win that in your eyes? Yeah, that's that, that seems to me how it should be. I mean, you could, I, it would be strange to me to make an argument for Kirk Ferentz. I mean, really, <laughs> you know, that, but the fact, I don't Close know. Close strong. Yeah, I mean, the, but the, the, that they're, the, the fact that they have a chance to win the West. So, yeah, it's got to be somebody from the East, I think. And, and I would say, at this point, uh, maybe Harbaugh, but uh, I, I don't know. Ohio State might lay it on them this week. When you look at the MVP, at least on the offense, is it definitely Casey Thompson for Nebraska? Well, I think you saw that without him, they don't really have a chance. And when, when Casey was injured, it was like two guys were injured and one almost because it takes Trey Palmer out of the equation, right. and I feel like that rhythm hasn't really caught up. I think Marcus Washington is a guy who's done some kind of good things kind of under the radar the yeah. last few weeks and, and played solid. Uh, but but without Casey, uh, it just felt like this offense doesn't know who they want to be, how they're going to attack. They can't throw it downfield. And then there's just no trust in the offensive line. And I, I understand everybody wants to take Mark Whipple to task right now, and I, there's a lot you can talk about there. But I also would get to the point that it's very difficult to be a play caller when you can't trust your line at all, when you don't feel like you can get three yards. And Nebraska's running backs have to do a better job too, frankly, of getting north-south on some runs and understanding this is, I can get three yards here and three yards is good as opposed to east-west and at second and 10 then. Yeah, I feel like that, that old man who's watching the game yelling, go forward, go yeah. forward. <laughs> I am an old man, but go forward. Because there are a couple times, we've been begging for Mark Whipple to change the run game. You notice how many times they went three tight ends in that game? Mm -hmm. A number of times. They were pulling guards. They were doing things that we hadn't seen them do, but Grant wasn't following the blocks or something was going wrong. Yeah, I, and I like a lot of things about Anthony, and he's got a great story and uh, had a great burst to this season to start it off. But um, as they go forward, they're going to need to find two or three backs um, that yeah. are Big Ten kind of backs. And the, the, the shame of it is we didn't get to see A.J. Allen, you know, because yeah. he, he kind of was, you're like, man, I want to see him go against these Wisconsin and Iowa's, see if he's that guy who can grind out yards. And so you, as we get to guys you got to keep on this roster, he's one of them. Oh, definitely. And you talk about that, Brian, keep guys on the roster. 
you know, December 5th will be the first yeah. day players go on the portal. Starting Monday after Iowa, you mm. know, everyone's going to be in a dead period with meetings with their players. What are you expecting um, next week to bring in? Not, not, not the coach stuff, but just the roster stuff and then the transfer portal and how wild this could be. Yeah, I think you're going to – you're going to get a lot of rumors, but also there might be some guys who just, I, I got to hold pad. I got to see who my coach is and who the position coach is. And there might not be as much movement for Nebraska right off the bat uh, with some of the portal stuff. But that's why it's imperative that um, you get, first off, with this hire, you got to get the right guy long term, right. obviously. But that December 5th timeline has made it so tricky where you feel like you want that guy in place early next week. Um, and then there's guys out there like a, you know, I don't know if like a Chris Kleiman's going to be in the mix or not, or could be, but he's a guy who could be playing in like the Big 12 championship right. the next weekend, and that complicates matters if, if you had a coach like that that was on your radar. Yeah. So to piggyback off that, do you have a feel who this guy is going to be? Because it's getting clear. We've seen Leipold <laughs> got the extension. Washington's coach got the extension. Mm-hmm. extension. Yeah. Stoops uh, in Kentucky got the ex- uh, the extension. So kind of eliminate a few guys. So it's getting close, but. Your sense, I mean, it's, I know it's about as clear as mud, but your, your, your feel of... Clear as mud is true, and it feels like you can... He- what I've noticed about this is I, I'll hear like eight different things from eight different oh, people. Yeah. There's not a lot of consensus on, on stuff, which is really interesting. And Trev has really succeeded. I know Sean would back this up, I think, with... Uh, just keeping the inner circle tight, like it's re- it's very tight well, it's over like there. It's, it's all, it's, <laughs> yeah, it's all coming from outside stuff and agents and all that sort of thing. I would say though, you got to leave open the possibility. And I I don't know with like a Matt Rule, and I know some people say, well, he's off the radar now. Never I know. think in these situations, you always got to be. Uh, think that a guy can circle back in negotiation. Yeah. Well, remember uh, Trev Alberts when he hired Dean Blaze that you right. know he turned Trev down. Yep, mm-hmm. Trev three came, times. Trev came back at him. So yeah. yep. don't underestimate that from Trev Alberts. Know three yeah, times. so the circle back is something I would keep in mind. And a guy like Matt Rule does have the relationship with Mickey Joseph. Important, you think, to Trev to whoever he brings in to keep Mickey Joseph? I I would think it would be a, a prominent discussion with yeah. the next guy. It just like, and the next guy I would think would be smart enough to say. This is a guy I would really could use to keep this roster intact to at yep. least have a base, you know, floor going into next year. Mickey means so much to so many guys over there. Um, obviously, he's a great recruiter, but I think he's really won the locker room where if, if he stuck around and and stood by whoever the next head coach is, yeah. I think that would mean a lot to those to those guys. And it would keep a lot, maybe some of those young receivers in the room too and stuff like that. Almost like keeping Turner Gill when Callie yeah. came. I wonder if you should uh, – you know, he, that you might have to up his salary a bit, though. I'm not his agent or anything. got to make a million dollars. He might dollars. make a million yeah. now. Yeah. Uh, pick for the Iowa game? Well, I, 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 as much as Iowa's offense struggles, it gives Nebraska a chance. But I, I always believe in that Iowa defense that they're going to get two or three turnovers, and Nebraska sort of plays into their hands, it feels like, every yeah. time in this matchup, even if it's looking good. Eventually that big mistake happens. Um, Hopefully this time Nebraska doesn't punt it off a guy's backside like happened one year. That was actually the last time Nebraska won in Iowa yep. when they punted off their backside. But <laughs> yeah. um, I'd say Iowa by a, a touchdown. They don't have a Kenny Bell. It would be nice to have a Kenny Bell back for that game. That would or be nice. Or a Pearsonell. Any of those guys, you know, punt return. BC, we appreciate it. Have a yeah. great Thanksgiving, man. Thanks, guys. Thanks a lot. Next up, Sean and I will dive into a couple of standout performances from the NSA State football games. But first, another look from Saturday. Courtesy of Hale Varsity, we're back in two.
Welcome back to the show. Michael Severe with Sean Callahan. Before we get to the guys from the NSA games, what about Wisconsin in terms of the, the visitors? Anything happen out of that? You know, some new offers were made, uh, but it was 11 a.m. game. Yeah. Um, not exactly Chamber of Commerce weather to bring in a lot of guys, uh, but a few underclassmen offers were made. Um, you know, no official visitors. Nebraska is sitting on those official visits. There will be three weekends in December. All of the current commits or anyone that's visited Nebraska already once, mm -hmm. they'll be allowed now to visit again mm -hmm. uh, once the coach is made. Even if it was Mickey Joseph, those guys could get a second visit. So um, look for Nebraska to probably bring in all of their current commits again on one of those December weekends. A lot of great games in the history of Class A. I remember I went to one where Sean Fisher had this amazing game, but was that the best that you've seen Westside and Gretna? Yeah, just the star power, the stage, the storylines of last year's championship game, right. the title being stripped um, I mean seven and three game seven to three combined of four whatever yeah you know, it, just yeah. a completely different type of game but you know the weather was perfect for throwing and, yeah. and what both teams wanted to do uh, just the star power on that field on both ends Gretna's final game yeah um, as a uh, one school community um, and you know 8,800 people I mean on a Monday on good. a Monday night yeah. imagine if that was a Friday night what yeah. that crowd could have been so uh, really remarkable that we had 8,800 fans at a high school game in Nebraska on a Monday night with all that said the best player a, a kicker a, a field goal kicker yeah and we've seen I mean I watched Alex Henry in high school Brett yep. Maher um, and you could argue Tristan Alvano right now at this point is better than those guys were and you know what really impresses you about Alvano is he kicks off the ground you know when High school kids can use a little tee box. It's like hitting a, like Jay Moore, hitting your, your golf ball off a tee versus uh, on, the, on the grass. Right. Everything he does is on the grass, on the ground. And every kickoff is deep into the end zone, sometimes out of the end and zone. And they kicked from the 40 in high school, but yep. he was going for, um, almost 10 yards deep yep. on kickoffs. And that was a huge advantage because every play was a touchback for yep. Gretna, where West Sides, um, you know, when they, they were returning their kicks to the 30-35, so Westside got a plus 10 on every possession because of the kickoff ability right. yeah, and yeah. how they were doing it. But you know this this performance and what he did, I don't know if we'll ever see a kicking performance like this again. Very few coaches would even want their kid to kick, you know, field goals that long in the high school ranks. Yeah, um, because of field position. Yeah. The way Westside managed the end of that game, it felt like watching an NFL game. Yep. You know, we'll like, settle for our field like, goal Let's just get around the 35-yard line. And, um, tweet after the game. Tristan Alvano got his offer first thing Tuesday morning from Mickey Joseph. He had a preferred walk-on offer, gets the official offer uh, from the Huskers. Um, so Nebraska obviously in a good spot. I mean, the big question was Timmy Bleak Road. Nebraska has him back another year. Right. But I think Mickey Joseph's like, no. You got to you gotta like, get this kid. We're, we're not overthinking this one. Right. I mean, he, he, Alabama would take this. Kick. This guy's Anybody. better than Timmy Bleak wrote. Yeah. I mean, the way the ball, you, the way he kicks the ball, you hear. You hear it. Sounds like a can. It's like Tiger Woods hitting the ball in the driving range. Completely you hear agree. the noise. Been that way since he was a freshman. Akela Binning, nine weeks off, comes back, wide receiver, safety, gets a couple of picks. Great, great game for him. You know, as that game was going on and he made a couple of big plays, Damon um, was on the sidelines. I walked by him. He yeah. goes, that kid's pretty good, isn't he's he? He's pretty good. And he I almost go, had yeah. three picks, too, yeah. You know, yeah, the two interceptions and just the situational football he played. You know, these little third down stick routes that he runs. I mean, in the context of the game, he was their third down and like six, seven type guy where he could run crisp routes. But to pick Zane Flores twice and almost get it a third time, um, you know, that just tells you what he brought. And they were playing without Jalen Lloyd, their leading receiver. So right. to get Caleb Benning back, that was as big of a difference in this game maybe as Elvano because some of those plays Benning made yep. helped Elvano get those field goals. Ben Bramer, best performance you've seen from a tight end? Yeah, no state championship game. Well, receiver. Yeah, oh, receiver. I mean, you, 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 I mean, just not just tied in. Futures tied in. Right? Oh, best pass catcher overall. Wow. Right. I mean, you look the the yards that he had: eleven catches on eleven targets for almost two hundred and fifty yards. Wow. Um, it was an all-class or uh, eleven-man playoff record for receiving yards in a game. Mm. Um, and he was a great blocker too. And he had an interception. And he had an interception I mean, it was, on top of it all. You know, and it, he's not a Husker yet. I, I think he's listed as a commit, okay? Right. But he is looking at Iowa State, and he's going to take an official to Ames. He wants to see who the new Husker head coach is. They want to meet with him. Wow. Um, so this is not a done deal for Nebraska. Um, be, until we really know the future, 
and Matt Campbell has done a very good job with tight ends uh, in general of getting involved with Ben Bramer. Yeah, and tight ends in general. They developed so many good ones. Last one, because this gets asked all the time. Zane Flores, any chance? I know he's committed to Okie State. Any chance the next coach could convince him? It's going to be extremely tough. I mean, the Flores, the Flores people, and by the way, it's Flores. Flores, and, and Flores. We, yeah. We've been uh, Zane we, Flores. We've been uh, pronouncing it wrong for Not four Flores, years. Not Flores. Flores. Right. Um, but Zane, um, you, you look at what he's done, and, and they're, they're such loyal people, classy people, by the yeah. book. Oklahoma State has done it right. They did the recruiting process the right way, the whole way. I have a really hard time seeing him um, switching in that situation uh, with the way Oklahoma State's recruited him. Thanks, Sean. Appreciate it. Time to take a look around the Big Ten. Michigan squeaked by Illinois. What a game. 19-17 to to stay unbeaten. And then, of course, Indiana. What a game going to double overtime to beat Michigan State 39-31. to And then it was a late field goal, of course, that lifted Iowa over Minnesota 13-10. to All right, let's dive into another coaching candidate for Nebraska. This week, we're looking at Dave Doran who is ending his season pretty tough at North Carolina State. This is a guy who lost to Boston College, and then they turned around and lost this last week to Louisville. I know they got some quarterback issues, but uh, he's never had a 10-win season while he's been at NC State, a bunch of nines, never finished higher than second in his division in the Atlantic. Um, and this doesn't mean a lot to a lot of people, but 58 and 64 against the spread, I'm just saying, he, he doesn't win a lot of games when he's not supposed to. What do you think about Dave Dorn? Well, this was supposed to be the year, and then yep. their quarterback got hurt. Again. And then his backup got hurt. Yep. So they, they've been starting um, M.J. Morris, a freshman, mm -hmm. who actually Nebraska recruited at one point a year ago. Um, so they're on their third-string true freshman quarterback right now. He had his team ranked up until about a week ago. 22nd. Yeah, when it um, was BC. You know, so they were hanging in there. But, yeah, he would take – I believe he would take the Nebraska job if okay. given the opportunity. Um, he's a Kansas City guy, played his college football at Drake. Right. Coincidentally, I think he coached at KU at one point. He's been at Wisconsin. Um, you know, he, he's been all over this part of the country, northern Illinois, took them to the Orange Bowl. Um, I believe, as their head coach uh, b way back. So mm -hmm. he's always had an interest in this Nebraska job. you got his offensive coordinator, Tim Beck. Yep. Uh, then you've got John Garrison as his own line coach. So there are some connections there. But it, as we're sitting here taping this show, it, it doesn't feel like he's the guy right now. What, one more stat, because no matter what happens, they're not going to get over 500. He's been under 500 in conference five different seasons since 2013. So I mean, he hasn't had the kind of success I think that people would expect if he's going to get hired at Nebraska. But yeah, doesn't doesn't check the boxes for me on the guy who I'd like to uh, turn this program around. He does. He's always played Clemson tough. Yeah, he has. State is always. They've should have had numerous upsets against uh, Clemson the last four or five years when Clemson's been on top. But that's just. It seems like that's a a bit of a reach. In that if. Dave Dorn was was would be the guy. I mean, that means <laughs> Nebraska got turned down, in my opinion, by four or five guys. Yeah. I don't think that I don't think he would have been, you know, on the. I would I would not expect Dave Dorn to be top three on Trev's list. Yeah, and I know this is something we'll probably never find out because why would Trev even say it? But do you have a feeling that he has been turned down? What What's your feel in terms of how this has gone for Trev and for Nebraska? Well, I think the biggest thing is once you engage with a an agent. Yes. Um, and that's your search for maybe it could be Trev Alberts or a coach. Mm -hmm. Not even an offer, just engagement. That leads to renewals. And we saw sure. Mark Stoops. He was engaged. He he they they Definitely. reached out to Jimmy Sexton. And the contract that he got, $9 million now, yeah. kind of felt like the max of what Nebraska was going to have to pay to get Mark Stoops. Well, he's getting that now from Kentucky. Um, Lance Leipel gets his new deal yeah. uh, from Kansas here on Tuesday night. And, and that the deal, deal that he had on his desk, according to people, for a few weeks. And I don't know what the terms are, if he's going to be in the five to six range. I think so where he's going to be. Uh, but I just think the sniff of Nebraska, the engagement, mm -hmm. these agents, that's their job sure. mm -hmm. to take that just – Trev Alberts, hey, how you doing? That's enough. Two million more dollars. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Even Kalen DeBorge, one year at Washington, gets his salary bumped because maybe he was mentioned for Nebraska or even Auburn, too. So you have those two big jobs open, it, it opens it up. You have a feel at all? I mean, I know we've talked a lot about this. But. Yeah, I, it's, it's crazy. I, I don't because it was, it's been, you know, Matt Rule was kind of the flavor of the last couple weeks. Yes. And it seems that that's kind of cooled off. Now you have Luke Fickle, who really hasn't been in those, I would say, the top, you know, we've, it was, it's always been kind of uh, Leipold, uh, Aranda, Aranda Campbell. In, now Luke Fickle kind of comes into this. So to me, it's, I feel like how quiet it's been, I feel like it's kind of one of these guys that haven't, we, that haven't really been mentioned. Um, 
and I, I were talking off um, with Greg before he got off, and uh, you know, I'd obviously love. I would take Urban Meyer. I'd love for that. That'd be sure. my one guy. If you could get him, I'd take him. Uh, if you can't get him, I really like uh, Luke Fickle. Will be great in my opinion. I really like Chris Kleiman. I like what he's about. I like the style of football. He's done it at every level. He's developed uh, guys. He's gotten K-State. Their offensive line is phenomenal. It's really good. I think you've seen Adrian have so much more success down there because he has actually protection and they can run the football. They run the ball. Deuce Bond is obviously a really good running back, but, but, uh, um, but I, I like him. I don't think, you know, other than Urban, I don't think there is, in my opinion, a slam dunk. Right. Uh, there's a guarantee. But what he... The guy that I want going forward, I, I, I like a Kleiman, I like a Jeff Munkin. I like the guys who it's all about development, toughness, discipline football, because that's what it's going to take to win and get back on top it, not in the Big Ten West and obviously in the Big Ten Conference. I'll give you a range. So we all thought 07, 08 that it was going to be Bo. I mean, it was Turner, Bo, but it was Bo. We all were surprised by Mike Riley. In terms of our surprise level for this one, where do you think it fits? Does it is it one of the twelve names you think we've been throwing around over the last seventy like, days, I, or is it off the? I think board? like Bronco Mendenhall would be a surprise. I mean, to me yeah. that would, that would be like a Mike Riley hire for Trev. Um, yeah, I, I just that would be out of left field. This because yeah. it's a guy that's walked away from BYU and walked away from Virginia. And he left to go to Virginia because of an opportunity to be in a power conference to make more money. I get that, but he did not. He did leave kind of broken a little bit from. Yeah, Virginia. it just. That would be a out of the field woman. Luke Fickle to me would be like walking into the bar, seeing the prettiest girl, and say "you," and then get her. I mean, that and you would actually be, get her. Like, in the, I mean, yeah. that because he's leather. the guy that I think people nationally be like, "There's no way he'd go to Nebraska." And right. if Trev were to pull that off, yeah. I mean, that would be remarkable. Because he was mentioned last year for USC, for Notre Dame, LSU, and LSU, Michigan State too. Or Fickle, right? Right. Yeah. yeah. So, but those he had a three big team, ones, though. So yeah. I think he knew he had a playoff team. So yeah. Michigan State, you know, he, that he, wasn't one. Yeah, he, he just didn't want. But that USC, out. Notre Dame, and LSU. I mean, and his are, old AD is yeah. at USC. Okay, so he that, that would have been an easy decision for him to make. But you, like you mentioned, he was in the playoff. You're not looking for a job when you're in the playoff most times. And, this is a year know, later. Right now, like they could win. They, they could be in a New Year's Six Bowl. They game could, yeah. If they win the conference or the American Athletic Conference championship game, yeah. I think are they going to rematch Tulane? It's probably going to be Tulane, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So Tulane, like, Tulane's already in, but I'm not mistaken. I don't believe that Cincinnati's in yet. Don't they have to win this week? I think they, and they could but the winner, They could get to the Cotton Bowl. Like, yeah. So he could still have a pretty good year there. Uh, but and they're going to the Big 12. I mean, ne is it next year they'll be in the Big 12? Yes, that's the schedule. There'll be three new teams in the Big 12. So that's all reasons. Um, so let's go to Iowa. Feelings about Iowa. We, we know what to expect. We know exactly what they're going to do. What do you think happens? I think you're going to see a, a similar the effort's going to be there. Uh, I think. The defense is going to play well. It's just whether or not can Nebraska somehow sustain drives. Not only, I wouldn't say the points, obviously score some points, but can they flip the field? You know, just if they're able to move the ball a little bit, pin uh, Iowa back, and then all of a sudden defense holds, you know, Iowa's lackluster offense, and then all of a sudden, boom, we get, to, mm. we get the good field position, and all of a sudden we're able to get three points. Because I just don't think we're going to be, we're not going to, we haven't done against anyone this year, but you're not going to be able to, you're not going to go 80 yards on this Drive Iowa the defense. You have to hopefully just get s a couple first downs. If you can't get points, punt it, force Iowa to, you know, pin them down deep, hold them, you know, you get a punt around the 50, a couple first downs, boom, bleak road, Get some points, three points, and I think it's going to be a low-scoring game again. I, I would, uh, I'd heavily take the unders on this one. Yeah, Sean. <laughs> yeah, I just think for Nebraska, this game is so similar to what they've seen the last few weeks. But Iowa it feels at least their defense is better than what Nebraska's seen. But they don't have the running backs. Right. Uh, Nebraska has seen four of the best running backs in the country. So can their defense slow down Iowa enough and just you know make Petrus because. Petrus is the worst quarterback Ferentz has had in a long time. I mean, just what, what they've done with him. Can they make him make a mistake and take advantage of that mistake? The Petrus is interesting because as bad as he can be at times, occasionally he will make the big throw. Niven Laporta is big because he's been good against Nebraska since his freshman year. He's made a lot of big catches. You mentioned the running backs. It really doesn't matter who I was had at running back, though. They've been successful against Nebraska for whatever reason. That The way they run outside zone, it's Nebraska hasn't been able to handle it physically. So if they come out running, it really doesn't matter who's back there. And Eric Chenander was actually fairly good at scheming against Iowa because that's his alma mater. He mm -hmm. played with Brian and for Kirk. 
So he understand he understood what they did they there. They still average over five yards a carry. I mean, there were <laughs> games though where I mean they were handling you know, you know moments where yeah. uh, who who was the D Daniels like they, they would handle yeah. like some of those linemen up front. Mm -hmm. You know he had a good attack scheme, but yeah, Nebraska would just always fall apart at the end of those games. One of the worst probably. Iowa offensive lines you've had. They're young. Yeah, sure. They're, they're, I think they go, I think they, I don't even think they have a senior on their offensive line this year. So I think it's all some freshmen, sophomores, and juniors this year. So that's why they've struggled a little bit offensively. And I tried to, I, I, I'm around a lot of Iowa fans at work. Sure. And they're just, they, <laughs> they get so frustrated. I'm like, listen, you guys have two to three draft picks on the offensive line every year. Yes. You guys don't have that. You, now they'll probably be that two years down the road, but you guys are struggling because you can't block anyone. <laughs> Look at us. We struggle because we can't block anyone. Yeah. Uh, so it's, it's uh, similar, but Iowa's gotten better, yeah. and that's what uh, you got to tip your hat to Kirk Ferentz. For they, they struggled, obviously, in the year, but they just somehow they get better. Offenses got incrementally better. That defense and special teams are on point. And remember, Iowa's three top receivers, two left, and one's been injured. And Keegan yeah, Johnson. Keegan so they, Johnson, yeah. um, you know, his future will be interesting. Like yeah, if, he, yeah. if he's at because it just it hasn't felt right there with his situation this year uh, being definitely. shelled for the whole year. Get your burning question, Sean. All right, my burning question. Thursday, eat your turkey. Friday, watch football. What <laughs> will Saturday bring? What will the weekend bring? Uh, will we be at North Stadium on Sunday, Monday? What, what's, the, what's this all going to look like when the, when the dust clears after Friday? Is this one going to seem? Is this going to be a, a similar scenario here, where I, f I feel like uh, Nebraska is going to hang in there, but uh, Iowa's special teams? I think there's just going to be too much and a game-winning field goal. I predict for Iowa. Can Nebraska break the streak? If they lose to Iowa, that'll be 17 straight between Wisconsin and Iowa. Can they break the streak on Black Friday? Don't forget to head to our website, click on the prediction. Jay, Sean, and myself will tell you exactly what to expect on Friday. Nebraska gets the field one final time in 2022, taking on the Iowa Hawkeyes on the road. Kickoff is set for 3 p.m. on the Big Ten Network. Next week, we're back to recap the game, start to unpack the season, of course, potentially talk about the next era of Nebraska football with guest Mitch Sherman from The Athletic. Our thanks to Greg Sharp, Brian Christofferson for joining us tonight. For Jay Moore and Sean Callahan, I'm Michael Severe. We'll see you next week on Big Red Rapids.